Tonight on Y News. The Department of Foreign Affairs vows to provide legal assistance to nine Filipinos recently sentenced to death in Malaysia. The Philippine Overseas Employment Administration halts issuance of Overseas Employment Certificate or OEC to newly hired Filipino workers bound for Qatar. Underground tunnels discovered in Marawi City as authorities continue clearing operations in the conflict-affected areas. The Philippine Gaming Corporation issues a suspension order against Resorts World Manila. The Land Transportation Office shows proper placement of gadgets inside vehicles under the Anti-Distracted Driving Act. And the Department of Health reveals increase in number of dengue deaths in 2016. Why News begins now. Good evening. The Department of Foreign Affairs vows to provide legal assistance to nine Filipinos recently sentenced to death in Malaysia. Roderick Mendoza explains why. Nine Filipinos are facing death after the Malaysian court sentence for capital punishment for their involvement in the 2013 standoff in Sabah. They are Julham Rashid, Virgilio Neymar Patulada, also known as Muhammad Alam Patulada, Salib Ahmad Imali, Tani Lahad Dahi, Basad Manuel, Dato Amir Bahar Hussein Kiram, the son of self-proclaimed Sulu Sultan Jamalul Kiram. Atik Hussein Abu Bakar, Al-Wazir Usman also known as Abdul, and Ismail Yassin. They were previously acquitted for crimes associated with treason and terrorism. However, the court approved their conviction for waging war against the king. The verdict was raised from life sentence to death. DFA says the decision is not yet final and will still be heard by the Malaysian Federal Court. Thus, DFA vows to closely monitor the proceedings of the case. DFA also promised legal assistance to them. Malacanang leaves it to the DFA to extend all possible assistance to them. Right now, uh, the DFA is exhausting all efforts to aid those Filipino sentenced to death in the Lahad Datu attack in 2013. So basically, they're, 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 it's in the hands of the DFA at this stage. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The Philippine Overseas Employment Administration, or POEA, has issued a moratorium suspending the issuance of Overseas Employment Certificate, or OEC, to newly hires bound for Qatar. Maki Libradilla explains why. Over 100,000 Filipino workers bound for Qatar have been affected by the suspension of deployment ordered by the Department of Labor and Employment. As of today, the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration or POEA stopped the processing of Overseas Employment Certificate or OEC to newly hires bound for Qatar due to the ongoing rift among Gulf nations. Such move, according to Dole and POEA, is to minimize the number of stranded Filipino workers should the conflict in the country escalate. Concern pa rin natin is the same concern na pag doon pag sakaling nagka-escalate, eh, mas kakaunti na lang ang i-repatriate. POEA also keeps an eye on recruitment agencies of overseas workers. We have also instructed our uh, Philippine recruitment agencies we have deployed the uh, overseas Filipino workers in Qatar to closely monitor their respective workers in close coordination also with their foreign employers. Meanwhile, the Qatari government has ordered Egypt National to leave the country within 14 days. This after the Egyptian government and other Gulf states severed ties with Qatar. According to Axe OFW representative Jan Bertis III, Egyptian employers might ask their Filipino house helps to live with them. Baka mamaya yung mga pinaalis na mga Egyptians o yung mga ibang nationalities like ng Baharinis ng uh, Qatar, bitbitin nila yung mga domestic worker. Ito ang problema natin, saan natin sila kukunin ngayon? For this reason, Bertis asked the Department of Foreign Affairs to coordinate with their counterparts in Qatar and appeal so that Egyptian employers will just leave their Filipino helpers when they depart the country. Makili Bradilia, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. 
Special Envoy for OFW Refugees and Environment Secretary Roy Simatu says he is ready to travel to Qatar should the President order him to go, especially if the ongoing diplomatic rift among Gulf nations escalate. Ray Palayo tells us why. Secretary Roy Simato said he would ask his undersecretaries to man the Department of Environment and Natural Resources should he be asked by the President to go to Qatar and assist our compatriots there. Simato served as the Special Envoy for OFW Refugee before President Rodrigo Duterte appointed him as DNR Secretary in April. During his stint as Special Envoy, he was tasked to look after the welfare of OFW in the Middle East when the Iraq War erupted in 2004. Reports of panic buying in Qatar surfaced these past few days when its neighboring countries cut ties with Qatar for allegedly supporting extremism, which the latter vehemently denies. This group composed of other friendly countries before, but because of there were some uh, differences among others, diplomatic differences, so the current ng kanilang uh, uh, broke, they, they broke the relation uh, with Qatar. Simato believes that there should be one nation who will act as mediator among conflicting Gulf nations to prevent further escalation of tension. Nandun yung pwersa ng U.S. In, right in Doha, Qatar. So yung, yung fear of uh, a frontal confrontation, confrontation among these countries ay medyo the threat level in that area hindi pa masyadong mataas. But should the conflict worsen, Simato says Filipinos in Qatar will surely be put at risk. So you have to bring them out. In the event na medyo uh, delikado, pero ngayon hindi pa naman. There are four threat levels eh. As of now, siguro threat level number two pa lang yan. Pag nag threat level sa three na yan, uh, that, that, that should start a uh, plan for relocation evacuation na yan. Pero uh, ngayon hindi pa naman eh. ATS OFW party list is urging the revival of the Middle East Preparedness Team, which was then led by Simatu, in order to monitor the situation in the Middle East and prevent Filipinos from being stranded aid the conflict. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Armed Forces of the Philippines denies report that Isnelon Hapilon has been out of Marawi City. Rosalie Kos explains why. This was the response of the Armed Forces of the Philippines to reports that surfaced yesterday saying Isnelon Hapilon, the emir or the ISIS leader in the Philippines, already escaped Marawi City. Meanwhile, the military admits to have discovered several networks of tunnels possibly used by the terrorist groups. Brigadier General Restituto Padilla says these tunnels built underneath the houses and buildings are not new. Old folks in Marawi said that those were already tunnels that existed before because of uh, previous conflicts. Uh, if you remember, in, uh, historically there was a siege of Marawi a long time ago, I think in the 70s, no, 1972 if I'm not mistaken. The military is hoping that as the Philippines commemorate its 119th Independence Day on Monday, the Philippine flag will be raised in all corners of Marawi City. The government forces are exerting all efforts to clear the remaining three barangays still taken by the terrorists. Our troops are working and working overtime to facilitate the liberation of Marawi at the quickest time that we can. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Officer PCSO General Manager Alexander Balutan said they are set to deliver the supplies of medicines and bottled waters for displaced residents in the evacuation centers in Iligan and Cagayan de Oro. The agency also vows to help in shouldering the hospitalization expenses of wounded civilians affected by the conflict. The official says PCSO personnel are now deployed in various hospitals in Lanao del Norte, Lanao del Sur, and Cagayan de Oro City to assist. May social worker doon. Nakukunik na kaagad doon sa amin. Pagka itatag kayo as PCS o uh, patient, imomonitor natin paglalabas na sa hospital, yung last hospital billings, 
eh, yun ang pag-uusapan kung ilan na ilan ang babayaran ng PCSO. The government hopes to liberate Marawi City by Monday. However, they are still facing a difficult challenge ahead. Victor Cosare tells us why. Surgical operations continues in Marawi City as the military hopes to end the crisis in the city by Monday, coinciding the celebration of the Philippine Independence Day. But despite being able to force their way into some of Maute Group's stronghold, the military says there is still a huge number of armed militants fighting against the government forces in Marawi. Aside from this, authorities discovered tunnels that could have been used by the terrorists to move from one place to another. The 1st Infantry Division of the Philippine Army says other lawless elements and prison escapees might have joined forces with the Maute Group. Based on our intelligence report and with the presence of the supporters and other armed groups in the area, uh, the, the militants are ranging from 200 to 230 uh, armed groups still inside the conflict area. As of today, authorities say 138 Maute Group members were killed in the ongoing firefight, while 40 from the security forces and 30 civilians also died in the crossfire. Meanwhile, the AFP is investigating 63 Facebook accounts that might have been used by the Maute Group to recruit, promote their activities, and publish their criticisms against the military. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue. Philippines. President Rodrigo Duterte explains why he does not let the Moro National Liberation Front 2000 forces to proceed and help the government in fighting ISIS Maute in Marawi City. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. President Rodrigo Duterte said he deferred the Moro National Liberation Front from joining the government forces in Marawi City because it might further complicate the situation. The senior promised to send also 2,000 with the MNL soldiers. Sabi ko wag, kasi pagdating doon maghalo-halo tayo. Na hindi lang ba tayo nakakaitindi lahat ng baga tayo-tayo na ang barilan doon. Aside from this, President Duterte also hits his critics who are questioning his declaration of martial law in Mindanao. The president said if he would be asked, he would not declare martial law. I'm the second president to declare martial law. I'm not proud of it. I'm not happy because it indicates something that there is a trouble. Meanwhile, the president mentioned about the brother of arrested and former Marawi City Mayor Fahad Umpar Salik, Solitario Ali Salik. Both brothers have an outstanding arrest order under martial law because of rebellion. Tumawag si Solitario. Sabi ko, ano ka ba? Kampi ka sa gobyerno o kalaban tayo? Kasi sabi ko, pinapahuli ka na yung sana. In the end, President Duterte has assured that the crisis in Marawi will eventually be resolved and he is determined to attain lasting peace in Mindanao. The chief executive also promised to provide sidearms for military personnel to protect themselves against insurgents. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. So let me just uh, tell everybody that uh, I have been great martial for Mindanao. Leaders from indigenous groups in Mindanao, together with human rights advocates, filed today a, a petition before the Supreme Court. Joyce Balancho will tell us why. Lumad leaders believe there is no sufficient basis for the declaration of martial law in Mindanao. Hence, together with other leaders from different groups in Mindanao and other human rights advocates, they filed a petition before the Supreme Court today asking it to nullify the martial law proclamation. Sa deklarasyon ito ay nang, talagang nangangamba kami, ay lalong, mas lalong nabigyan ng kapangyarihan ang mga militar na uh, yung, uh, lumabag ng karapatang pangtao namin, lalo na sa amin mga katutubo. According to Karapatan, one of the petitioners, a week after President Duterte proclaimed martial law all over Mindanao, they have recorded at least four cases of extrajudicial killings. 
They said many also were displaced during aerial bombings outside Marawi City. Napakaraming mga tao na illegal na inaresto at dinetain, no? invoking martial law, including uh, mga workers on strike doon po sa Compostela Valley na nag exercise ng kanilang civil and political rights. The petitioners were joined by Bayan Secretary General Renato Reyes and Gabriela Women's Party Representative Arlene Brosas, who both said they will continue to take to the streets their call to lift the martial law in the region. Meanwhile, Marawi women, represented by their lawyer, also filed a similar petition before the Supreme Court today. They're also asking the highest court to exercise its duty to review the declaration. Uh, ginagawa ng uh, mga petitioner dito, sila ay mga kababaihan mula sa Marawi, mga ordinary yung mamamayan, pero humihingi sa Korte Suprema na paganahin yung uh, review process na itinatakta na ating konstitusyon. Now there's a total of five petitions against martial law pending before the Supreme Court. The first ones were filed by the group of Congressman Ed Selagman, Senator Laila Delima's camp, and other religious leaders. Joyce Balancho, UNCV News and Rescue, Manila. The Development Budget Coordination Committee forecasts a sustained economic growth in the country with an expected gross domestic product growth from 6.5% to 7.5% in 2017. Nel Marie Buhok is in Quezon City to tell us why, live. Yes, Nel, go ahead. Jeco Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez, Budget Secretary Benjamin Jokno, and Neda Director General Ernesto Perna presented their forecast for the country's economic uh, economy for next year during the Development Budget Coordination Committee meeting this afternoon. According to Development Budget Coordination Committee, they forecast sustained economic growth in the country. Strong inflation will remain stable at 2 to 4% up to 2022. Gross domestic product growth at 6.5% uh, to 7.5% in 2017, which is likely to jump up to 7 or 8% from 2018 to 2022, while foreign, uh, foreign exchange rates is expected to rise from 48 to 50 pesos per U.S. dollar for this year. DBCC also sees the possible impact of the first package of the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program which has projected revenue of 2.4 trillion pesos and 4.5 trillion in 2022. The overwhelming support from the House shows how seriously they consider the tax reform because it benefits the, the far majority of Filipinos and everyone wants to see the economy grow and benefit them in the coming years. Also, Secretary Pernia sees improvement in the country's employment rate. In terms of employment, uh, you also saw that, uh, I'm sure you have seen the numbers already, employment uh, numbers were pretty good. Unemployment uh, rate uh, went down from 6.1%, 6.2% previously to 5.7%. Also, the economic managers of the Duterte administration revises its uh, proposed budget for 2018 to 3.767 trillion from uh, 3.84 trillion pesos. The forecast and recommendations of DBCC will be submitted to President Rodrigo Duterte for the approval. Diego? Thank you, Nel Maribuhok, reporting live from Quezon City. Senate President Coco Pimentel is pushing for a congressional inquiry on the alleged computer glitch on the financial system claimed by Bank of the Philippine Islands. According to Pimentel, the said system error is risky despite assurance from BPI that there was no incident of hacking in its systems. The proposed investigation will focus on the security protocols being implemented by banks. The senator said local banks should monitor for possible cyber attacks amid reports of hacking in international banking institutions. The Land Transportation Office has presented today the proper positioning of cell phone or gadgets inside vehicles under the revised implementing rules and regulations of the Anti-Distracted Driving Law. John Nano will tell us why. According to the Land Transportation Officer LTO, cell phones or gadgets should be placed inside vehicles 4 inches from the dashboard. Assistant Secretary Edgar Galvante explains this is the rightful position of gadgets so as not to affect the concentration of motorists while driving according to their study. 
yung measure ng 4 inches would be from the top of the dashboard no? to the upper edge ng uh, aparato o ng uh, uh, device na ilalagay. Halimbawa, meron naman dyan mga built-in na yung from the car manufacturers nakakabit na yun. That's authorized, that's recognized. The Department of Transportation targets to publish the revised implementing rules and regulations of the anti-distracted driving law on June 13, while the re-implementation is expected to be in force on June 22. The Transportation Department says trainings and seminars of all traffic law enforcers from LTO, LTFRB, MMDA, and PNPHPG are continuous to ensure that all of them are knowledgeable on the implementation of the said law. LTO again emphasizes that drivers can still use their mobile phones and gadgets while driving, provided that they should be in hands-free mode. Kung ito yun, ano, kung ito yun kailangan imanipulate, yes. no? Habang ito drive sila, kailangan tumabi sila at dun lagawin. Mm -hmm. Kahit na kahit na authorized na e equipment yung nandon, kung kailangan bitawan may manibela o ano, eh, you know, eh, tinkerin mo para bawo yun ang bawa. On the other hand, LTO is continuously studying how to regulate the placement of car teens on vehicles to easily monitor if the drivers are complying with a sad law. It was in May 23 when the Transportation Department decided to temporarily suspend the implementation of the Anti-Distracted Driving Act after causing confusions among motorists. Joan Nano, UNC News and Rescue, Quezon City. Next on Y News. The Quezon City Trial Court defers the presentation of witness in Senator Laila de Lima's drug case. And the Department of Health reveals increase in number of dengue deaths in 2016. Y News will be right back. Y News would like to thank the following. Darwin D. Trading Medical Supplies 7M Construction and Development Corporation Energy Tech Engineering Services and Trading El Pan Consultancy Services Corporation Summit One Business Solutions Incorporated 347 School and Office Supplies Incorporated The Philippine Gaming Corporation has issued a suspension order against the resort's World Manila. In its order, PyCor enjoins the Hotel Casino from doing business while it is being investigated over the June 2 incident. PyCor also warns that resort's world management will face more sanctions if they violate the order. Resort's world management said it has already suspended its casino operation since June 5. The family of one of the victims in the resort's World Manila attack has not yet received any financial assistance from the hotel casino management. Meanwhile, the family is planning to file charges against Rizal Funeral Homes who took their son's body. Robbie De Guzman explains why. BJ Pagsibigan of San Rafael Bulacan was on duty as desk officer when a lone gunman attacked the hotel casino complex last Friday. He was one of the fatalities in the incident. His body was recovered near a restroom. He died of suffocation. According to his family, they have not received any amount of financial assistance from the management of Resorts World Manila. They also argue that the company even promised to shoulder the education of the victim's orphans, plus 1 million pesos financial assistance. The Public Relations Office of the Resorts World Manila says they are now communicating with BJ's family to provide the assistance they need. Umalis po sila before lunch, sir, sa bulahan niya, sir, diba? Pero may naka-designate naman, sir, per family meron po kami naka-assign at sir. 
financial assistance lang yun. Iba pa yung pag-assist namin sa kanila sa ibang-ibang gasto sa pagpapaliging at pag-urol. BJ's family also complains against the Rizal Funeral Homes who took BJ's body. Binaboy nila anak ko. Inotopsin nila tapos itinambak lang sa isang tabi. Ni hindi nila inimbalsa mo or what hanggang sa masira ang katawan nito. Nasa stage of decomposition na siya. Habang nakaburol siya, pwede namin titigan pa siya na yung mga alaalan niya sa amin. Pero ganyan, titigan mo anak mo na hindi siya sa muka para kang nakatitig sa ibang tao. The family plans to file formal charges against the funeral home. Rizal Funeral Homes, meanwhile, has yet to comment on the issue. Robbie de Guzman, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The PNP Supervisory Office for Security Investigation Agencies adjusted its schedule of release of investigation results over security issues at Resorts World Manila, particularly during the attack on June 2. The police unit is still reviewing the consolidated reports, which details a number of lapses in security by the hotel security service provider and C. Lanting security specialist. Also on Tuesday, the PNP will decide on whether to revoke the license of the security agency or have it pay certain amount of fine. The Philippine National Police urges hotel security managers to strengthen their respective internal securities to prevent another incident similar to the attack in Resorts World Manila. Joyce Balancho tells us why. National Capital Region Police Office Chief Oscar Albayalde has advised the hotel security managers in a forum in Pasay City to invest more on internal security. He says since the police has limited access to their establishments, hotels should make sure that their security personnel has proper training in using firearms. Kailangan talaga na nilang mag-invest on their internal security, particularly mga hotels where they have their own internal security. Remember, even the policemen are not allowed to... Uh, conduct visibility or patrol yung, uh, uh, ano, yung loob ng, ano, ng hotels nila. It's because they don't want us to get inside. Hotel managers say they are now planning on investing on more security personnel and their training. They might also request the government to review the accreditation process of their security personnel. We have what we call an accreditation process in the Department of Tourism that also covers security. Yun ang gusto namin pag-usapan at ma-expand uh, so that we are able to cater to the threats that are happening now. Despite the Resorts World Manila attack, hotel security managers say the industry has not yet been affected by the tragedy. I don't think uh, with the past reaction of our police in the conduct of the investigation of the incident, I don't think it has affected much the accommodation sector in terms of the influx of the guests. Joyce Malancho, UNCV News and Rescue, Pasay City. The Philippine National Police reports that the rate of crime incidents in the country continues to decline this year. Mon Hock Son tells us why. The Philippine National Police reported that in the previous months, the ongoing war on drugs and the internal cleansing among the ranks of the PNP greatly contributed to the decline of crime rate in the country. Based on the latest PNP data revealed during the second Real Numbers Forum, murder cases dropped since the Upland Double Barrel was launched. Cases of homicide, physical injury, rape, robbery, theft, and carnapping also decrease. Illegal drugs, it plays really a, a vital role in all our crimes. Kaya nga po, pag binawasan nyo po ang ating, anta, ang ating drugs, ang illegal drugs, babawas po sigurado ang krimen. The anti-drug war of the government is now on its 47th week. Pidea says they are targeting to increase the numbers of drug-free places in the Philippines until the end of President Duterte's term. With the number of, uh, of uh, barangays that was cleared from uh, January to May, 3,677, we are making progress. Pidea also gives an update on the anti-drug war operation of the government. Starting July 1, 2016 to June 6, 2017, the PNP has conducted more than 6,000 anti-drug operations, more than 80,000 personalities arrested, more than 1 million surrenderers, and more than 3,000 died in drug-related operation. Meanwhile, the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism questioned such data. PCIJ argued that the numbers were not clear and misleading and inconsistent. 
PNP refutes the allegations. The, the numbers always evolve. It actually increases. And because of validation, it sometimes goes down and up. Those are the things that we, we always consider. We just don't get data and data and then we don't, we don't evaluate and analyze actually. Starting today, PDEA will release weekly updates of the figures associated with the anti-drug war operation of the government. Mon Hock Son, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Quezon City Metropolitan Trial Court has deferred the presentation of House Justice Committee Chair Reynaldo Umali as a witness in the disobedience to summons case of Senator Laila de Lima. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. The presentation of House Justice Committee Chair Reynaldo Umali as a witness in the disobedience to summons case of Senator Laila de Lima has been deferred. This after de Lima's lawyer questioned the two versions of his judicial affidavit. Both were dated May 17. De Lima's camp received a copy of the original affidavit, but the prosecutor submitted an amended version to the court. Three days before po siya pinadala sa amin, which was supposedly the original judicial affidavit, eh, under the rules po, five days before the hearing po dapat siya pinapadala. So late na po yun. Tapos po, pagdating po kanina sa hearing, bago po magsimula, biglang nagabot po si fiscal ng amended judicial affidavit. Quezon City Metropolitan Trial Court Branch 34 Presiding Judge Maria Ludmila Di Pio Lim decided to defer the presentation of Umali's testimony. The prosecutor was directed to reply to the opposition of Dilima's lawyer and the proceedings will resume July 14. Nasa biyahe kami nun eh, kanya we were just communicating by phone. So uh, yun siguro that was the cause of the correction. Pero it's a uh, uh, very minor, uh, wala namang it doesn't change anything. But Dilima's lawyer says this is not a simple correction. Aside from the amendment on the affidavit, there was no copy of the supposed arrest order against Ronnie Dayan. Only a copy of the order of contempt was attached to Umali's affidavit. Dilima's lawyer says the issue on technicality is important, especially because the court has denied their motion for reconsideration on its ruling because it was filed a day after the deadline. Strictly then, that judicial affidavit should be expunged from the records and the witness should not be allowed to testify. Sa amin, one day late, we were punished. So we're asking the same fidelity from the court. Dilima was indicted for allegedly convincing Diane to escape the house probe on the believed drug trade. If found guilty, Dilima faces one to six months imprisonment and a maximum fine of 2,000 pesos. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Secretary Martin Andanar clears President Rodrigo Duterte from the controversial info campaign video on martial law released by his office. Victor Cusare explains why. During today's interview on the program Get It Straight with Daniel Razon, Presidential Communication Operations Office or PCOO Chief Martin Andanar clarifies certain issues involving his office. The latest was regarding the information campaign video which promotes martial law should be the rule of the land. Though he did not elaborate further on the matter, he made it clear that President Rodrigo Duterte had no idea about it. Oh. So what was that uh, well, uh, consulted with the president before no, you? No, hindi, no, hindi, hindi na. Hindi na kasi yung mga ganitong mga Hindi naman kina kailangan pa oh. So, <clears throat> hindi na umabot ito sa sa tax. But what what was what is important is we listen to the people. Yes. Uh, uh we come up with uh, communications. Mm -mm. He added that upon realizing that most Filipinos disagree on the video, his office immediately deleted it. The issue is just among the many controversies being raised against the Secretary's way of leading the office, especially because of the manner of his dealings with his former colleagues in the media. As a former commentator and a journalist as well, one of the things that we uh, in the broadcast industry practice is, of course, we pursue questions most of the time that we really wanted to be answered. Diba? And uh, on the other hand, It, ang trabaho mo naman ngayon, eh, umiwas kung makakaiwas ka dun sa mga sagtano na ayaw mo sagutin. <laughs> Wala naman akong iniiwasan ng mga tanong. Mm -hmm. I just make my agencies responsible and accountable for what they also do. I let the head of agency answer it. Mm -hmm. And um, kung talagang hindi niya talagang kayang sagutin, 
that's the only time that I come in. Secretary Andanar also denies the issue that the palace allegedly barred him from speaking in press briefings in Malacanang. Uh, the reason why I gave the responsibility, everything, to Ernie was because the uh, PCOO is composed of eight, nine agencies. Mm -hmm. Ngayon, our government media is not as strong as it should be. He added that he actually rejected the position of being the president's spokesperson before, but he realized that he needed to help Secretary Abelia in dealing with the media since the government is still establishing a new administration. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine Coast Guard, along with other civilian volunteers, will hoist the Philippine flag at the underwater plateau of the Philippine Rise. This coincides with the country's Independence Day celebration on Monday, June 12. The divers will have to plunge 54 meters deep to attach the Philippine flag made of fiberglass to a concrete foundation. According to the AFP Northern Luzon Command, this aims to insist the patriotic ownership of the Philippines and emphasize the strategic value of the said maritime zone. The group, including the UNTV diving team, left for Philippine Rice last Wednesday on board BRP Davao del Sur. President Rodrigo Duterte will lead the 119th Independence Day celebration on Monday at uh, Rizal Park. Consequently, Independence Day commemorative rites will also be held in different parts of the country. In line with the celebration, there will be a job fair at the Senior Citizens Garden at Rizal Park from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and free medical services at Burnham Green Park from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. LRT and MRT lines will also operate free of charge on June 12. Meanwhile, Malacanang cancels the traditional Van de Noor, supposedly set on Monday morning. Presidential spokesperson under Secretary Ernesto Abella said after the Rizal Park flag racing ceremony, President Rodrigo Duterte needs to go back to Mindanao to attend to matters pertaining to the Marawi crisis. Van de Noor is a yearly diplomatic event hosted by the president as the head of state. The Department of Health expects possible increase in the number of deaths due to dengue in, this, in the country this year. Aiko Miguel explains why. A total of 1,097 individuals died of dengue in the country in 2016 from 220,000 confirmed infections. According to the Department of Health, this figure might increase this year as DOH expects rise in the number of dengue patients due to reproduction of dengue-carrying mosquitoes. DOH is constantly monitoring possible breeding areas of the Aedes aegypti in the country. DOH Dengue Express lanes are also active in DOH-accredited hospitals nationwide to assist possible dengue-positive patients. So those with fever will be segregated, especially the children. They'll have a separate line. A tourniquet test can be done immediately, a complete blood count. DOH advises parents to always check their children in case of fever, especially school-aged children. DepEd also intensifies its campaign against dengue in schools. The whole school environment is dengue-proof. So, dapat hinanap na rin yung mga maaring uh, water containers okay, and others that could breed these uh, mosquitoes. In schools, we expect, because it's routine, that any child who has fever should be assessed. Meanwhile, the administration of dengue vaccine to grade 4 pupils is already on the third phase or dose. DOH claims to have received order to complete the dengue vaccination to dispose all remaining vaccines. May recommendation na sa aming kalihim para gamitin to sa ibang lugar sa ating bansa. Uh, siguro ang number one candidate dyan ay si Budal nga sa nabanggit ko na last year mataas sila. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Bakati City. Filipinos in Ho Chi Minh City were satisfied with the consular services offered by the Philippine Embassy in Vietnam. RJ Timoteo tells us why. Napakaganda po ng, uh, um, ng kanilang pagbibigay ng serbisyo dito 
uh, maayos naman po yung facility at uh, lalong lalo na po uh, napapasalamat po kami dahil merong ganitong uh, uh, occasion para sa lahat ng mga OFW na nagtatrabaho dito sa Ho Chi Minh. We've been to embassy a few times on past few years but it's a bit kind of inconvenient and uncomfortable but we now convenient uh, the process is so systematic the cooperations of everybody it's really helped us to make our uh, at least our visit so successful these were the observations of overseas Filipino workers here in Saigon in line with the second mobile consular services of the Philippine Embassy held from June 3 to 4 this year to address the increasing number of Filipino nationals availing of consular services and overseas vote registration, the embassy decided to transfer to a bigger venue at City International Hospital. Bigger space needs more manpower. That's when volunteers from MCGI and UNTV offered their service. They volunteered to offer free sugar and blood pressure check, photocopying service, free snacks and drinks, as well as in guiding the applicants on their way to the venue and to specific service. Salamat din sa inyo. Uh, so far, sa takbo naman ng, ng mission ngayon is um, mas mabilis, mas organized. Kasi dati, security guard na Vietnamese ang mag assist minsan sa labas na hindi naman naiintindihan kung passport releasing ba, renewal ba. So, kailangan may tao pa magtanong o mag-assist sa iyo. Overall, the two-day consular mission served at least 600 Filipinos in Ho Chi Minh. Because the main office is in Hanoi, only a few embassy representatives are able to go to Ho Chi Minh City. So having an extended help from volunteers is something they immensely appreciate. Kaya po, um, sa mga darating po namin na mobile consular services, we hope that Members Church of God International can still help the embassy po. Ano? Kasi malaki po talagang tulong yung nagagawa po ng volunteers po para sa embahada at saka po sa kababayan po natin. So marami pong salamat at hanggang sa muli, uh, mabuhay po kayo. Embassy of the Philippines is encouraging Filipinos here in Ho Chi Minh City to calendar the next consular mission which is scheduled in August. RJ Timoteo for Serbisyong Kasangbahay. Another heart-pounding clash awaits UNTV Cup fans at as the AFP Cavaliers meet, meet the judiciary matches on the UNTV Cup hard court. Bernard Dadis will tell us why. The Cavaliers, led by head coach Sonny Manukat, will use their speed and endurance in the ball game. Siguro yung running game namin, yun ang papractice namin. Yes, yung judiciary medyo malakas din, prepared din siya eh. Siguro at balls down yung preparation pa rin namin para sa team, malalaki rin kasi yung judiciary. On the other hand, Coach Joey Yabut's side will use their height advantage through their towering players, Court Attorney 6 Romulo Paras Jr., Supreme Court Judicial Staff Officer Dito Sevilla, and Manila Presiding Judge Manuel Gerald Toma Cruz. Medyo lamang kami sa ano eh, sa malalaki. Okay, kaya ganun pa rin ang strategy ang gagawin namin. Uh, Pinractice namin ng press break, tsaka hard practice kami, maraming drill. Siguro ganun pa rin ang preparation namin. Both the AFP and the judiciary team have two won games and one lost game alongside the PNP and the DOJ. The Cavaliers Magis battle will be aired live on UNTV emanating from the Pasig City Sports Center on Sunday with live streaming via UNTVweb.com. Bernard Dadis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippine. Well, those are the reasons behind the news, June 9, 2017. I am Angelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Rina Villamor Camara. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Thank you for watching. Why, why? News?